Welcome everyone to tonight's journal club. Uh, the topic tonight is practice influencing articles with one of the AO greats, one of the legends of AO, Dr. James Kellum, who uh, we're lucky enough to have here with us tonight. This is me, I'm the moderator. We also have two other faculty, Malcolm Bond from Duke, and John Kopp from Mississippi. Here are our disclosures. I don't believe there are any that are relevant to any of the talks. Uh, just a little statement here. AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. It does not endorse nor promote the use of any products, service of commercial entities. Equipment used in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes. We won't be using any of that anyways, but the intent is to enhance the learning experience. Our learning objectives are review the classic journal articles that we discussed here today, explain how the literature advances or has historically changed orthopedic practice, identify best practices based on scientific evidence, and our participation in a lot of discussion about these concepts and principles. Here's our agenda. We're going to spend about 15 minutes per article, or maybe a little bit more or less time in each article. Um, we already went through the introductions. So how did we get to these articles? Why did we choose these? Uh, we asked Dr. Kellum a series of questions about articles uh, that he thought were important to him, including the article that regarded uh, the trend that did not catch on, and a few articles that he was proudest of, as well as an article that significantly impacted his practice. And he sent us a whole bunch of great articles and we selected these ones. So I'm gonna go ahead and get right into it. So I have the first article out of Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 1997, looking at nerve monitoring for uh, as tabular fractures for detection of sciatic nerve injury. Um, as we know, patients with sciatic nerve injury tend to have poor outcomes after acetabular fracture. Uh, about 39% of these do not recover and about 25% of nerve injuries are iatrogenic. And there was a study done at HSS prior to this study that looked at neuromonitoring um, and showed that it may be protective against uh, you know, sciatic nerve deficits if you know you're pressing on the nerve. So Dr. Callum, what was it that that sparked uh, you know interest in this study? What 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 brought up this idea? What, what was going on at your institution at that time? So yeah, first let me thank you for inviting me, the old man, uh, <laughs> to come and do this. It seems like it's sort of I'm looking forward to it. It's sort of fun to go back and relive your past. So. In So in the mid-90s, as you can see from the time of the article, probably 91, 92 on, there was a great flurry <laughs> in the orthopedic trauma realm of the use of SSCP in, um, for acetabular fractures to prevent sciatic nerve injury. And there were several things. Helfett wrote one. He was sort of a big proponent. Mike Baumgartner wrote another one. And I believe there was a, a third one. And one of what stimulated us to do this was we had it was becoming sort of standard of care mm -hmm. that everybody who was doing acetabular fractures had to use somatosensory evoked potentials. However, in our institution in Charlotte, Carolina's Medical Center, um, it was really difficult because um, the SSEP and all the technicians were run and owned by the neurosurgeons, and so they weren't very happy about giving them up. Plus they were using them for all their cases as were the spine surgeons. So we come along and say, hey, look, we've got, this is coming along. We have to do this. The answer was, uh, we're sorry. You know, if there's nobody, nothing happening, we'll do it. And so we decided that we should probably look and see whether or not what we were doing was causing a problem. And that's what stimulated the article to put out into the literature that if you do acetabular fractures and you know what you're doing and you're doing it in a, in a standardized manner, you can achieve the same results that you can with SSEP. And it was sort of to provide everybody else in the literature with some data that if they were, you know, because the big worry was you'd get an um, sciatic nerve injury, you get dragged into court and some lawyers holding up Helfit's paper and saying, hey, <laughs> you know, look, you didn't use it. So we wanted something in the literature that you could hand up and say, yes, but if you do it this way, or if you do it um, in, in a standardized fashion, you can get away and you don't need, a, you need to do this. 
what's interesting if you look at it as time went by it's disappeared right um mm -hmm. it it just gradually went away and i think this article probably was what started it as people began to realize well we don't need it um and so it just disappeared so i think it was something that maybe changed the practice and thank god stop something that <laughs> Um, you didn't want to get involved with because it was a pain in the neck to set up. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be the same thing in our place right now. Um, do you, was there anything different that you were maybe doing at the time that other people weren't doing to have such a low incidence of nerve injury? Um, I don't think in, in the uh, article we described, we, we did most of these, if not all of them, lateral. Mm -hmm. A few of them would have been done um, prone. Uh, Steve Sims did a lot of his prone and the rest of us bossy and i would do them lateral and um we made a big point of finding the nerve um and then we also released the gluteus insertion onto the femur um theoretically to take some of the tension off and make it easier uh, on it and um, i'm not sure not sure that makes a difference uh chip route who's around the corner right you know same place i am he will absolutely say you don't have to do that and you can protect the nerve without it. But it's something we did. Um, I think the lateral position is is easier on the nerve. I always, anytime I did a prone thing, is I always was petrified because the people on the other side of the table are always pulling on those you know, retractors, trying to look over and they're tugging right on the nerve. So it may be just the lateral position, uh, care to find the nerve, tra trace it out and release it uh, so that it was um, free may have been the difference. Um, it's hard It's hard to tell. That's how we were trained to do it. That's what we did. Do you think that you mentioned the gluteus maximus release? Do you think that maybe there are some patients that you should absolutely do it in, like really obese people or maybe very small people where there's not a whole lot of room for attractive placement? Yeah, I think there. I think there's a place for it. I think it, you're right. In small people, um, it's it's probably where it is. If you're in and you've got it's tight, mm -hmm. and in, in some individuals, um, it you could. It's interesting that that region becomes very very short, um, and can be very very difficult to maneuver around. And if you just release the gluteus off the femur, the whole gluteus falls back. And then suddenly you, you can see it better. So I do think there's a place for it. Um, I think when you go in, if you're in there and you find the nerve <clears throat> and it's easy and there's no tension on it, and everything's fine. I don't see a point in, uh, in releasing it. Yeah. Were there any findings that were surprising to you or any other uh, surgeons that were involved in the study? Um, in all honesty, I think the surprising thing was how few nerve injuries we had. Um, in the, in the group. And cause I would have thought, you know, we had one, I think it was, it was one or two in this out of a, about a hundred patients. And, um, I would have thought we may have had a couple more, like, you know, a few people had a little higher incidence than that. Um, and that sort of was, was the surprise, which was one of the, um, issues that we had with the paper was we got a lot of, um, pushback from reviewers that the monitoring of the patients was inadequate. So in what, you know, it was like, well, how do you know all you got your residents seeing them, uh, et cetera. And, and they just write down, you know, you know, no abnormality detected, et cetera. Um, that that's true, but we made a point of, um, looking at and seeing the patients and testing them all. I think, you know, all three of us um, at some time preoperatively tested every patient um, and knew what exactly was going on. And we can, we kept getting this back and we kept finally saying that, and it was, Oh no, you don't, nobody does that. You know, you don't quote. The answer is yes, we did. Um, I was always petrified of it. Um, partly because in my early career, uh, my only, you know, touch that I don't get me now, but I got sued um, or potentially sued for a sciatic nerve injury. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, through an ilinguinal approach, but um, that was early in my career, my second year in practice. 
And I've always lived in, you know, sort of with great respect of the sciatic nerve and has tender fractures. So I like to know what's going on. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything that was underrepresented in the study or anything you wish that we would have potentially done or looked at? Um, I think, I don't think so. I think the, you know, I think the idea, ideal thing would have been if you could have ever done a prospective study on this, just right. observational to do it. Um, but, it, it, you know, at that point, that would have been difficult. Yeah. And we felt we wanted to get this thing out and, and going because it, you know, it was the, <clears throat> it, the SSEP thing was sort of snowballing. It was, you know, yeah. whenever you went to a meeting, it was, oh, we've got to do it. You have to, this is it. And we're going, wait a minute. No, you don't. <laughs> so well, we, we certainly appreciate you advocating for not doing it. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are a number of reasons why we wouldn't want to be doing it now. But yeah, no, it's, um, so it's, it's, it, as I say, it's difficult to set up because in spine, the patients don't move, right? Yeah. And in in this, you've got the leg free draped. And so you've got all these wires coming out of the leg and you've got to put it on and drape them. And, you know, every time you move them, um, you, you know, you could knock the lead off. And then if you knock the lead off, you didn't know. And then the other thing was, is, you know, we had the other problem is, well, what do you do when you're told that the signals disappeared? Um I was going to so be my saying, question. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's that's the problem with it is if you're saying they're doing this and then so I say, oh, the signal's gone. Well, you take all the retractors out and you sit there and you yeah. wait and you pray and you massage the nerve or something and wait. And then <laughs> if hopefully it comes back, if it doesn't come back, well, what are you supposed to do? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're out one leads fell off. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's either that or you you bag the nerve. Um, yeah. And so now, you know, in the middle of the case, so, yeah, but it's, uh, not it's not, yeah, I do think there is a point. It may help you a bit uh, that if you suddenly start to get changes in the signal, you can know where your retractors are. Mm -hmm. And I would, and I think in probably, if you really are think about it um, in probably um reconstructive work for acetabular fractures sort of you know very delayed ones or if you're osteotomizing it mm -hmm. and moving around the posterior column etc there's maybe a rule for it um particularly if the nerve itself is um bound down or there's a bunch of bone and you're trying to dissect it out so there may be still a rule but it's a very limited rule all right that was great thank you that was about 15 minutes, so there's no questions in the Q&A that I see right now. I don't know if either John or Malcolm, if you had any additional questions, otherwise we'll move on to the next one. No, Dr. Kellum got right to it, right as I was thinking of asking it, so. Great. All right, the next article is fracture of the distal tibia metaphysis with intraarticular extension, distal tibia explosion fracture. Yeah, I... Uh... I think calling it a distal tibia explosion fracture is is much more fun than <laughs> than an AO four three C three three. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, so this is an article published in nineteen seventy nine, but from a series um, of patients collected from seventy five to seventy seven, uh, twenty six total. A were the rotational variants. B were the axial load variants. Um, and one of the things they pointed out was the most common mechanism was fall from height. And then they noted that only three were from skiing. Uh, and I think that's in relation to the European literature. Um, the torsional or rotational intraarticular pylons uh, did quite well. Um, and then the axial load explosion fractures uh, did okay. Um, what I thought, you know, in this case is that ORIF and reduction outperformed management or not upper management regardless of fracture type. Um, and then they made recommendations that are sort of pillars of the AO um, even now as far as stable fixation reduction, but early motion. Um, and then they had some commentary on, on non-weight bearing. So um, Dr. Kellum, you know, these injuries were the early publications from Rudy and Allegar were coming out in 73. And so it looks like you were on the, the 
front edge or the leading edge of North American thought, you know, with collecting these cases within two years of sort of the early publications coming out um, of Europe, of Switzerland. But then it wasn't published until 79. And it just made me wonder, um, were there any ideological differences or impediments being on the North American side of the Atlantic that you ran into in adopting and publishing this treatment strategy for these injuries? Uh, yeah, it's this is it's an interesting uh, saga. It's it's sort of why I sort of put this paper in is is for several reasons. Uh, this was done when I was a resident. Um, and Jim Waddell, who's the other author on it, um, was sort of just starting off and in his career, and he had got sort of an interest in this. And I happened to be his resident when I started. And he said, well, we got to look these up and things and started to do it. Um, one of the interesting facts, since I trained in Toronto, and that's where I was at this time, is that Tile and Schatzker uh, were both in, in Marv Tile and Joe Schatzker were both in Toronto at that time. Now you have to realize that those two individuals were the first people in, to bring AO back and the whole concept back into North America and into Canada. Now, Howard Rosen in New York had also brought it back, but there was a tremendous sort of reticence in the US to operative treatment during the 70s, in the early 70s and throughout this. So. Um, operative treatment and the whole idea of open reduction internal fixation was not something that was very popular. Now in Canada, it had a similar type of thing, but because we had Schatzker and Tile and they had been trained in the, in the method, we were operating on a lot of um, fractures. In fact, we were doing a lot of, of internal fixation. And this just happened to be one of them that we were doing. So <clears throat> this was coming out there was also a tremendous, if you read the literature coming up to this time, anything written on this fracture basically told you that you never operated on it. Uh, they all did badly. And it's because they all did badly, wrap them up in a cast or just go ahead and fuse them. And they're just, they're horrible. And that, sort of, and that was sort of the um, attitude at that time. So this paper came along and we did this. And then Interestingly enough, it was accepted um, for presentation initially um, at the American Association for the Society of Trauma, which is an interesting organization. It's a series of, it's mostly general surgeons. There's some orthopedic surgeons in it, but it was the organization in the 70s that was basically in North America focused on looking after trauma. And so, or any kind of orthopedic paper uh, at that point uh, particularly if it was controversial, would end up getting ex accepted there. So that's where we submitted it. It was accepted, and um, that's where it came. And then because because if you get a paper on at that organization, it has to be published in their journal, which probably meant that not very many orthopedic surgeons ever read it. Um, but um, that's sort of the history behind this and the fact that... Um, you know, we got to do it. And I think the answer is, is that when you look at it, um, it's much the same as we did there. I was trying to look at it um, to find out whether we, we never did. We did not talk about the delay in treatment um, <clears throat> with these, with the soft tissue side of it. But I can tell you that one of the um, big things in Toronto was most of these patients were delayed. I think most of these were done somewhere between seven and 10 days because they were all, they all came in, they were all put in splints. They were all put in bowler brawn frames and elevated until such time was deemed that their swelling had gone down. And so we were already dealing with, you know, the soft tissue management at that time without an external fixator. The other interesting aspect in this is, is that we also used, what was known then as the Roger Anderson device, which was an old external fixator to distract the joint, which is something that, you know, in the late eighties and nineties became, and it still is extremely popular, but that's how we were looking in the joint. Um, speaking of fixation, um, you, you mentioned in the paper, some AO techniques of neutralization and buttress plating and the images 
showed primarily interfragmentary screw fixation. And it made me think about, I went down deep dive and looked up when pre-contoured plates came out. And it looks like that wasn't until the mid eighties. <clears throat> Correct. Um, and so what were some of your fixation strategies? You know, were you doing direct the interior approaches, clamping, lagging? Um, did you have anything for the joint other than bone grafts? Um, so, yeah. So basically the, the standard incision here was the, whatever you want to call it, the anterior anterolateral incision anteromedial that comes down just off the crest of the tibia curves down and goes underneath the medium allelis that was the conventional standard approach and you fixed if the fibula was broken you fixed the fibula and you left an eight centimeter um, space between the two of them so that that was sort of basically out of the swiss side as well so we were pretty much following what rudy and algauer had said um, basically a lot of the pictures in there just showed lag screws, but they were on the simpler fractures, the more complex fractures. At that time, again, it was, you know, lag, you reduced the joint, lagged it, and then attached it back to the diaphysis, and all the plates had to be contoured. So we had no pre-contoured plates. Um, so they were all straight plates. They all had to be contoured. Um, and one of the problems we had was a lot of these plates were massive. Um, there was a plate that was originally designed by Rudy and Algauer for this, which was a massive, uh, big, it was sort of thicker than, it wasn't as thick as a four or five, but it was much thicker than a third, one third tubular or half tubular, semi-tubular, but it covered the whole anterior aspect of the tibia. And I think in a lot of situations here probably killed a lot of the bone. Uh, bone grafting we used as a method, just like we do now, as a structural method to support um, the reduction at the joint. And um, so that's it. The weight bearing in this, I think, was delayed for a long time. Um, I, it says three to five months. I'm not sure we ever went five months. But a lot of it had to do with just the um, fear of our fixation not being strong enough. Um, to be able to let them get going at six or eight weeks and um, making sure that they were healed. That was going to be, I think, one of my other questions was the paper, it sounds like time to weight bearing you for your protocol was eight to 12 weeks yeah, with a long range of immobilization, but then recommendation three to five months. And it was going to be, did that evolve? And was it based on limited fixation strategies for the joint, haywires, grafting? And so you Kind of that evolved, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it evolved over the period of time. And initially is um, a lot of times it was just, you know, in the, in the so-called rotational fractures, they were essentially treated with screw fixation only um, because they were essentially like either big oblique or spiral fractures that entered the joint or, be, you know, and so you could fix them back. There was no buttressing. And so they were all placed in casts. Um, the more complex, the, the explosion fractures, we would have probably more fixation in there. But again, uh, I think it was, as we were evolving through this, was a fear that if we didn't immobilize these patients, we'd lose it and the fractures wouldn't. And we were never sure, I think, about how how good our support of the articular surface was. So we wanted to protect them from, you know, doing any kind of walking and a cast seemed to be a reasonable thing to do. Um, did you guys ever leave the Roger Anderson traction on postoperatively like a neutralizing X fix or was it primarily casting? It was occasionally we would if the, um, if, if there was some, um, you know, uh, reason that we couldn't get the joint reduced. I think in several cases, we left the Roger Anderson on as a distraction device. Um, I see the next article coming up, so. Uh, oh, that was an accident. Okay. A couple more minutes if you have more questions. Well, I have I have one more and then I'll, well, I have a lot more, but I have one more um, and then I'll let, uh, I'll let other folks jump in. Um, you know, the lesson that reduction quality outperforms injury severity uh, I think it's a pretty important concept. Um, but then in reading the discussion by the other surgeons, it was clear <laughs> that there was some disagreement. Um, right. 
that's that surgical quality could outperform a bad injury. Um, and you sort of touched on it in the first question I asked, but wh where did the trend, how did the needle move um, after this article? Like at when did um, anatomic reduction, stable fixation, early active motion of pylons start becoming more of the mainstream um, after your first report of this in North America? Um, I'm not sure this paper, as I say, stimulated that, but I, I think there were several more papers that were coming out at that time showing that, you know, the management of interarticular fractures operatively uh, was worthwhile and that the fear of, you know, and sort of the hanging of the crepe on a lot of these injuries uh, was because people didn't know what to do or how to do it or didn't have the equipment to do it. And so I think it was an evolution. So I, I think you, we, we saw, you know, as I, as I look at it, I, I was trained to do this. More and more people across, you know, Canada were being trained, I think, in the U.S. And as the 70s moved into the 80s, you began to see more and more places. And I think also as more as the sort of orthopedic trauma came along, um, and people you began to see more people not there were no orthopedic traumatologists yet at that time but more people looking and spending more time understanding fixation and fractures you began to see more people doing you know doing this and, and fixing these fractures um and so I, th I think that's where it came until you know I think we got into the game whereas when you got into the late 80s early 90s we began to see the fact that we had forgotten about the soft tissue side of this. And uh, we were getting into a bunch of problems with, you know, wound sloughs and infections and problems there. But um, it's certainly, I can tell you, a much easier thing to manage an anatomically reduced and fixed joint that goes off and gets osteoarthritis. Um, I, I do think that there is a, you know, yes, anatomical reduction, putting it back to where it belongs, I think is the best for the articular surface. Uh, and, but there are injuries in which the articular surface has had it. Uh, yes, you can put it back, but I think the cartilage is probably dead and there's not much you're going to do. However, if you're going to give it its best chance, if it's where it's supposed to be, I think, and you can move it, I think you'll get the best result. And I think that was it. You know, people went through this idea of thin wires, hybrid frames you know, the Iowa group and all of that. And that sort of has, you know, basically fallen to the wayside as well, because I don't think the results of that were ever very good. Yeah, still, uh, I think always has been and always will be a challenging injury, uh, especially the explosion type, right? The difference yeah. between the torsional pylon versus the multifragmentary articular pylon. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think if you look at it, any interarticular fracture from that is from high energy axial load is a problem for you, you know, for sure. I've never, I've never figured out how you do the same thing. You go up to the tibial plateau. Yeah, it's about the same, you know. Were you keeping people in the hospital for that seven to 10 days and then checking their skin daily or how were you guys yeah. doing that time? Yes. Yeah. Yes. At that time, uh, hospitalization, you could keep someone in the hospital practically for the rest of their life and nobody bothered you about it. Um, yeah. you know, and, uh, so it was, it was very easy to keep these people in, um, at that time. And looking for the same things that we look for now. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. did you do with blisters at the time? Um, we just covered the blisters, left, and left them go. I don't, I, I, I just put, you know, some kind of non-adhesive and adherent um, dressing over the blisters and then just let them go where they want to go. Yeah. Great. Dr. Um, so the, um, the axial pattern obviously was a little bit more challenging to reduce probably because of the impaction associated with it. Um, so how were you all managing impaction, marginal impaction? Were you getting an autograph? Were you using definitive K wires? Like how were you guys thinking about that at the time? We were using um, either autograft, iliac crest, um, and it depended. It was it was a bit surgeon dependent. Some people would use iliac 
uh, Crest Cancellus bone and pack it in there. Other people would take sort of either a tri or bicortical chunk of iliac crest and jam it in as a structural strut. And the other thing at that time, and I cannot remember the name of what it was called, but there was this bovine bone that you could use, and it was very popular um, as an ale as a xenograft um, to use as a structural graft. And so they were the three things that I can remember that we used. Uh, rafting screws, um, not really, uh, because at that time we were still looking at, uh, there were occasional three, five screws, but generally most of this was four, five. Right. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next article if that's okay with everyone. I don't see any questions currently. Next right. article, yeah, so fractures. Go ahead, sorry about that. I was just going to introduce it. So yeah, I have the next article. Um, so uh, the article is entitled Immediate Internal Fixation of Open Fractures of the Daphnis of the Forearm with an all-star lineup here. So this was JBJS uh, a little bit after the articles we discussed. Retrospective study of two centers, Sunnybrook and uh, in, uh, Harborview. And these were uh, basically highlighting 57 patients that had open daphnis fractures, both bone fractures, uh, they were treated with immediate plate fixation. So um, the outcomes were extremely high um, and uh, complication rate was pretty low. So wanted to just open it up with a question, Riley, Dr. Callum. So uh, what was going on at the time? What was the thought process in terms of management of open fractures? Um, and, and what was the impetus behind this study? So if you go back and if you look at the in the mid, mid to late 70s, and Ray Gostillo at that time was writing, you know, the articles, Gostillo and Anderson articles. And in several of those articles, uh, he was adamant that internal fixation was never to be put into an open fracture. And they should all be done with some external fixation or, or casting. So there was a lot of debate going on at that time as to, you know, what you can do. And particularly in the lower extremities, um, it was, you know, most people would go, God, you would never put anything in an open fracture. You just treated them. And a lot of them would be in these monster X fixes or, or casts. The forearm and the upper extremity was a, seemed to be a little, little bit different. And because of the need to get people moving and to get going again, um, it was sort of felt that maybe um, we could uh, potentially get around this and get around the, the problems of infection and, and vascularity um, by fixing these acutely and immediately. And that was sort of the philosophy. Now, the other f interesting fact in this is, is that if you go back into the AO philosophy, the AO philosophy of open fractures was stability promotes vascularity and also decreases the incidence of infection. And a stable fracture is better fixed than not if you get an infection. And so again, our place was into that idea. We fixed a lot of open fractures and Hansen in Seattle had the same philosophy. He was AO so as well. So they were fixing a lot of these too. And Bob Foster, who is, is an upper extremity hand surgeon um, at that time in Seattle also was very interested in it. So um, I got interested in this when I was a fellow in Seattle and started to look at it out there. And then I came back to Toronto and kept doing it. Uh, Roy Mowad um, was our fellow um, just after I got back to Toronto. And Roy got tied in with us in Toronto on this. And then he went out and did a fellowship with Ted and carried it on out there. And, and so that's how the whole thing got going. And that's how the combination of the two centers put together um, and basically showed that immediate internal fixation of most both bones of forearm, unless there's, unless there's a significantly severe crushing injury, um, can be fixed and managed um, with immediate internal fixation and let the patient start moving. Awesome, yeah, that's uh, that's really good context. So, how was this? How was this paper received? You know, when did it start to adopt and change practice? Like, how 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 was it received by by folks in the North America? 
I think it was received extremely well uh, because I don't think we received really no, um, basically 86, it came out. Um, we really, by that time, I think most of the people in North America had accepted internal fixation, that it was good and that this was just one, one more thing showing that this is a worthwhile thing done properly with respect to your soft tissues and knowing what you were doing that this was a good thing and I, it began and I believe most people, at least I, as far as I know, and most trauma centers uh, pick this up and we're fixing fractures, you know, both, both, both bone forearm and most upper extremity fractures uh, very acutely if they were open. Another follow-up question here. So um, you talk about the surgical techniques and how, um, you know, surgical execution was important for um, success rate as well as the severity of the soft tissue envelope at the time of the injury. So did you have any, did you have any kind of pearls on, on soft tissue management or, or surgical management of, of these open forms at the, at the time of their injury? I think that the, the biggest thing about this was, is the debridement and understanding um, what you have to do that th this, when you're doing this, and if you're going to go ahead and internally fix uh, open fractures, you have to do an adequate, uh, very adequate debridement and realize that even, even if you don't think the first time you've done it, you come back and do it until you have a viable bed um, around your implant. Otherwise you're going to, I think, get into problems. The other aspect of it is, is that, and whether this is right or wrong, um, is that we were very adamant about the fact that you cannot leave cortical bone with no blood supply in the wound. So we were very aggressive in this and several other papers in taking out any cortical bone as, as long as it did not bleed, it was thrown away and leaving a defect. And then understanding that particularly in the upper extremity, handling a defect is not a big deal. You can bone graft that usually with cancellous bone. If it's big enough, you can sometimes get some kind of vascularized graft in there. But generally speaking, you can handle the uh, the defect relatively easily. You cannot bone graft it at the time you fix it. Uh, that's never been successful, but certainly you can come back um, two to three weeks down the line when the wound is settled, the wound's healed. You know you don't have an infection and go ahead and do it. The other side of it um, was achieving the appropriate stability. During this period of time, there was a, um, a tendency um, with regards to internal fixation, there were several different things. One of the things were, were happening was in order to get smaller plates, people were using semi-tubular plates on, on the forearm. I don't know how many of you ever seen a semi-tubular plate. That's, it's basically a thin, thinner plate. Uh, it's, it's, as you say, it's half a tube. It's not like the third tubulars, but it's about the same size but it was a large fragment, but it does not have the strength uh, that a four or five plate had, but a four or five plate is far too big for the forearm. And then when people began to realize that the three, five or the small fragment set came out, that it was suitable. And this, this appeared about the same time as, as we were starting to do this, that you could get good fixation. And as long as you had you know, suitable span, as long as you had at least four cortices on both sides of your fracture, uh, you would generally have good stability and you could uh, let them move and get going with it. So um, a, mat a matter of changing um, implants as they grew and we got newer implants um, that more were easier to use in this area and understanding how to create stability with it was an important aspect of this. Yeah, speaking of uh, stability and different uh, techniques for different type of modes of healing. So the, the paper kind of discusses, obviously, if you had a simple fracture, you're going for absolute stability and uh, compression plating or lagging neutralization. Then it also mentions, um, you know, in the common unit fracture pattern, the utilization of autologous uh, bone grafting acutely. Well, and I'm trying to clarify whether or not basically this was done at the time of the initial fixation, or you kind of mentioned a little bit a while back that it may be done in a delayed fashion. So can you expand more on like the autologous bone grafting and the indication for that uh, in this paper? So basically it was never, it, 
I think it was probably done, I think in looking at the paper, there may have been two or three pace, patients who got an acute bone graft. And as they, what usually happens in an acute situation is the bone graft dissolves, just disappears. Um, and that's been sort of standard anywhere you do this in the acute side. Why? I'm not sure whether it's a rapid influx of vascularity and just what takes it away. I, I, I'm not sure. So generally speaking, our bone graftings were done, as I said, when the wound had healed and you had a, you know, a viable uh, arm and you went back in. And that would any be where could be anywhere between, depending on what the case was, 10 days to two or three weeks and that you'd go back in. What cases, generally speaking, um, if you could not, if you could not achieve absolute stability, um, they probably got bone grafted. Uh, obviously, defects, but um, and if you think about it, if you've had some of the wedge fractures in which the fragment was devascular, it would have been thrown out, and so you would have had a a partial defect on one cortex they would be bone grafted as well. So we would tend to bone graft everything that we could not get absolute stability in. Awesome. Um, another kind of uh, broader question here. So you have the late Ted Hansen as a senior author who was a pioneer and uh, innovator and somebody uh, that you knew closely. So I was wondering if you could just shed light to the audience, maybe some wisdom that you learned from him and, and what he would uh, you know, ask us young surgeons to think about in our careers? So uh, Ted was, um, you know, a pioneer in North America and well in the world in um, orthopedic trauma. There's there's Hanson, there's John Border, um, Al Alga, or a couple of other Europeans, Mueller, uh, and uh, um, they, that group, were sort of leaders in the use of orthopedic or use of internal fixation and the management of injuries. And, and Hansen is the guy who brought that along with Schatzker and Tile. But Hansen is probably the one who really pushed most of this in the multiply injured patient. And the thing that Head did and what he what he basically challenged fellows is to think out of the box. Okay. So anything that we did, so the, you know, the immediate fixation of fractures, that was his idea that nobody, nobody was too sick not to be operated on. And he got a lot of grief for that, but he stuck to his guns and he showed that it worked. And that I think is what he did is he, what he taught me was to, you know, whatever, whatever you think is right, make sure you know it's right and question it. And if, you know, put it to you people, same thing. Don't be um, complacent. Uh, yes, we know what we're doing, but keep thinking. Keep thinking about what you can do and what you can't, can do. And the other thing that he was very, very big on was principles. If you understand the principles of a certain situation, and as long as you abide by those principles, you can pretty much do anything. And you'll get away with it, you'll get the thing to work. And so understanding principles, understanding the basic physiology of something, and then applying it is what I think he did. Uh, and what his whole uh, mantra was, if you, even if you look later as he moved into the foot and ankle world, it was a similar thing, challenging what was thought to be standard of quo, uh, standard of care, status quo, and getting people to change. So I think that's, you know, as well as, you know, being the leader, he's also the man who challenges the dogma, which I think is his big thing. Love it. Did you guys have any other questions? You got all mine. We can move to the next one. You know, I think, John, I don't think there's anything in the. We're uh, good in the Q&A. Yeah, we're good in the Q&A. All right, we'll move on to the last article. Um, so closed lock instrumentally nailing its application to combinated fractures of femur, um, Kemp's and Groff's and Beck. Um, I thought this was a fantastic paper. I um I was I was really excited to read it. Um 
we'll get into it. But I, if folks in the audience haven't read it through and through, I feel like everyone should because it it touches on ex exactly how to nail a femur forty years ago. Um, so comes out in eighty five, and my understanding is this is one of the first papers to sort of discuss locked intramedullary nailing. Prior to this, these were nails that would control coronal plane but weren't length stable. Um, and in this particular case, they touched on highly comminuted fractures or fractures with um, segmental bone loss um, rather than simple transverse patterns. Um, most were highly comminuted, a couple with bone loss, 19 were open, uh, and they achieved very high union rates, low non-union rates, um, all of which they were correct with exchanged reamed uh, upsize nailing. Um, and what they reported was effectively better reduction characteristics for more challenging fractures, shorter hospital stay compared to the alternative treatments with low uh, complications. Um, and that's a very brief summary um, of the paper. To piggyback off Dr. Hansen, and I bring this up because Jack Wilbur at at Metro had told stories about Dr. Hansen, like not even allowed to have residents with him when he was using intramedullary nails out in Seattle and how taboo it was uh, to be, to, to be nailing femurs or tibias. Um, so Dr. Kellum, what was your practice at the time? What were you using? What were your colleagues using in sort of, you know, in Toronto, I guess in 85, you were still in Toronto. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like the reason this paper is here is if if there's one paper um, that changed, has changed my life, has changed every orthopedic trauma surgeon's life for the better was the development of the lock nail. And the lock nail has, has been around. If you go back into it, uh, Kunchner had a lock nail. He developed one. Uh, Clemens Shulman earlier in the late 60s, early 70s, created a, a lock nail. Um, the design of it was the, the proximal lock of it was too oblique and it kept cutting out as a trochanter. And then Gross and Kempf modified an AO nail and changed a few things and brought it down and started doing these things. At that time, um, I was a fellow, so I I had been in Seattle in 80 as a fellow. And at that time, Hanson was making his own lock nails. He would drill, take them down to the machine shop, drill holes in them. And because he had worked with Clem and Shaman, and um, we would come in, he basically showed showed us, you know, showed me how to how you freehand the distal locking and the proximal locking. And then we'd use these for occasional comminuted multifragmental femoral shaft fractures. But otherwise, there was no lock nail in the early 80s. And what we did was that we could, the only fractures you could nail were mid shaft, short oblique, or transverse fractures, and in which you could achieve um, two centimeters of nail bone contact on either side of the fractures. So you can imagine the limited number of fractures that could be nailed. And if you look at the Winquist web article in which they reported their results initially for IM nailing, because Ted brought this back and taught us how to do it, they had tremendously good results. But these fractures had to be either, usually were plated, okay? They would be uh, fixed with an open reduction and um, fixing. And in Toronto, um, intermedullary nailing, um, they had had extremely bad experience with it um, in the late 50s, early 60s. And it was something that was basically thrown out and was never to be used. Um, I was sent to Seattle as a fellow out there by Tile to, to find out whether Hansen was lying about um, I am nailing. And when I found out and got there and saw what was going on, the answer was, no, he wasn't. This is how you do it. And this is it. I subsequently, um, interestingly enough, then went to Switzerland to do a research fellowship in Davos, and Gross came and gave a talk um, to the to, at the research seminar, 
and showed these cases of basically femurs blown apart and tibias blown apart, putting this nail in and then they healed. And I'm going, where in the world did you do? How did you do this? And I was fortunate enough when I got back to Toronto in about 81, 82, to be able to go over and spend time with Strasbourg at Strasbourg and came back. And how Medica, who then had the nail at that time, brought it into Canada and Toronto and in Vancouver with Bob Meek and Mark Boyle. So we were using it about 82, 83 to start to treat these fractures with it. And um, so it, you know, it then moved on. The issue with it was, is everybody thought this was going to be an ex like an external fixation device. And at that time, they had a high incidence of delayed and non-unions because you were fixing one end and this end, it looked like an X-fix. And everybody goes, oh my God, they're never going to heal. And lo and behold, these things healed like mad and went on. And then, um, so that's how this, it, it evolved uh, through through the whole thing. And then gradually got, you know, once we got through this, it's an interesting, um, this was an interesting situation in how they introduced this. It's the only probably implant ever been introduced properly into orthopedics. Um, there were about 10 of us in North America using this. And we were basically, we signed a contract with How Medica that we would not talk about this nail or publish anything on it until they had collected, and I've forgotten what it had to be. It had to be two, 250, 200 cases they had to do for the FDA to prove that it would work. And then once they did that, then they allowed us to publish. And that took us about two years to get that all done. So for two years, there was only about 10 of us doing this and learning the out. And then it was released and then basically became, you know, the standard of care like everybody knows how to do a lock nail now okay yeah um, here it's it's um absolutely basically a I, pgy1 uh, pgy1 operation so no yeah. i mean you say that but they touch on a bent ball tip guide wire positioning don't pull too hard on the perineal post how right. you achieve reduction um using like i mean it was great they they every tip and trick was there um one question I have technically about this is um, they made a point to talk about start point and right. all of these were choke start nails. And while they touched on medializing your start point to prevent against varus, it seemed like there was a fear of getting to the piriformis fossa for on axis nailing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that evolution um, from, you know, in the eighties or, yeah. So initially, um, basically Kunchner uh, and the Europeans, and basically when nailing sort of came into North America, the tip of the trochanter was where all nails started. Now you have to realize that nails at that time were slotted and they had a one to two millimeter wall thickness. So they were relatively flexible. So if you started a nail in the tip of the trochanter and looked at it, it would always bounce off the medial cortex. And that was always an issue with this. And then um, in, I, in the, about 79, 80, Ken Johnson and Al Tenser did this study where they showed that inline nailing, the starting point was the piriformis fossa. And so North America moved to the piriformis fossa. The Europeans refused to because they said you will wipe out the lateral, lateral circum, branch of the lateral circumflex artery and you'll kill the femoral head. Well, the answer is, nah, it didn't happen. Yes, they had some, there's supposedly one or two cases in Europe somewhere that no one could ever show anybody, but that's why it was. And that's why the Europeans continued. And that's why in this article, he used the tip of the trochanter. And basically it was a straight nail. It was a regular nail. It wasn't a cephalomedullary nail, but it's interesting when you see it, they had already learned that if you go too lateral with your start on this, you're going to put the proximal um, part, particularly in proximal third fractures, into varus. Uh, and they did it in a couple of them, as he as he talks about. But that was that was the debate, and even into the '80s, they I can tell you when I was in Strasbourg, you know, I was using piriformis nails in Toronto when I went there in '82. 
God, you couldn't convince Arson to move to the piriformis fossa. He thought I was absolutely nuts and that I was going to, we would all, all end up, you know, having all these terrible things. Now in kids, adolescence, a different matter, but um, in the adult, uh, the blood supply to the femoral head is such you don't have to worry about it. And I don't, and I think we're well aware from, away from that artery. So that's, that's sort of the debate that went on. I think, in fact, I think even today, you'll still find people in Europe using the tip of the trochanter, although some of them do use a piriformis fossa. <laughs> um, another, I guess, interesting aspect in this article was their post-operative protocols. Um, this paper predates like Brumbach and Bone and some of the weight bearing. And so for them, um, they were protecting weight bearing for about three months. They were waiting to see callus then they were dynamizing and then they were advancing weight bearing. And obviously that is, you know, very far removed from how we treat, you know, femurs now. So I was just going to ask um, sort of your thoughts on some his history on, on that. Was it apprehension the nail would break? Was it due to, like you said, you know, nail geometry? Um, and then the dynamization and hardware removals was some, this two part question. They, they also removed the nails and, when I was in core, they were removing a lot of plates even still. Seems like routine hardware removal is common in Europe. And so is that a cultural thing? Or was this a thought that the long-term retention of implants would cause harm? I just I was really curious about some of the context of this. So yeah, so if you go back to the dynamized static locking versus dynamic locking was a thought process about um if you if you had a pr very proximal or distal fracture that was length stable you were using this device as a derotation device um, on it. So you got ismic fit and you had locking with the screws proximally or distally, and you could let them get up and going and, and go. So you could dynamically nail lock, or you did static if you did not have length stable, or you were concerned with any kind of shortening with maybe a long oblique fracture and that sort of thing. Their concern was, as I mentioned, that these weren't going to heal. And this idea of dynamizing was to promote in the static lock situations was the idea to promote further union. Um, it was, uh, I think it was an interesting concept, but the problem with it was by the time six weeks came by, eight weeks came by, particularly in North America, um, in which it was harder to get patients in, what you were finding was that um, they'd come in, they'd have this big gob of callus, and you'd go and dynamize them, and you'd go, you know, why am I doing this? Um, but that was, that was the protocol, and we all followed it. Then um, Don Wiss came up with the uh, observation that he had a series of patients in California, a bunch of bikers and his migrant workers who never showed up. Um, and we all had this too. I can remember vividly. We had a bunch of patients who um, <clears throat> decided that for some reason they would come back in a year. You didn't see them. They went away and came back. And he got was seeing these and they were all coming back and they were all healed. And so this whole concept of dynamizing the nail disappeared. And then Bobby Brumbeck presented the paper on it saying, this was ridiculous. You didn't have to do it. One of the problems with dynamize, if you dynamize a fracture in which there wasn't a lot of healing, um, you could end up with issues because what would happen is if there was no healing, they became unstable and they became painful and they went on to a non-union. So you, it, there was a small series you had to be very careful with that you didn't do it. But most of these healed with regards to it. So basically, over the period of time, everybody just gave up the whole concept of um, dynamizing the nail at six to 12 weeks, you know, to get around the concept of it, if you wanted to, that's why they created the oval hole, so that you could get a little bit of dynamization, but still keep the thing. So that was, that was sort of the manufacturer's way of getting around this. The implant removal is a um, cultural thing. Um, Europeans, a lot of them don't like having implants in them and they re remove them. It's not, I don't think it's as prevalent now. 
as it used to be, but it used to be most of them came out. You know, the thing was, I was not born with a snail, therefore get rid of it, and, and I wanted out. And so they do take a lot of implants out. It's the same, I think, in the Asian world. There's a lot of implants removed there from a cultural point of view. Um, in North America, um, it's not. Most people, you tell them, oh, we're going to remove your implant, and you <laughs> Come on, I'm not having another operation, but um, it is cultural. Yeah, it was just interesting because uh, very different, obviously, than how uh, we nail um, long bones today. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's been an evolution. Nick had asked a little bit about this um, before, um, but length of stay was like 18 to 24 days, even for an isolated femur, longer for the polytrauma. Um, was the protocol in Toronto similar? No. Um, were you, you know, were they getting like in-house PT this whole time? And then was it primarily like the Brumbeck series with early immediate weight bearing that expedited that transition to patients, you know, short of medical need. Now this turning into something where they're in the hospital two days. Yeah. So um, in, in Europe, there is a, um, there was at that time, I don't know what it's like now, but at that time there was a, a ten, not a tendency. It, it did happen that they kept patients for a fairly long time. It was expected that you would be in the hospital and that you would get up and you would, you know, do your physical therapy and you'd gain your motion back and, and that. And there was no, you know, demand to get patients out of the hospital. Um, and so that was not an issue. And, and most places you would see in the European thing, they, you've got these seven, 10 day visits and stays in Toronto at, the, at that time. Uh, I would think we were probably looking at three to five days, um, at that, um, and, and even shorter, if you had an isolated femur, um, I would think that we would probably be to, to, uh, 48, 72 hours and the patient was out and gone. Uh, weight bearing, um, I allowed most of these patients to weight bear um, as much as they could initially. Um, and that was mostly because as they as you, as you got going, you saw them were healing and um, it wasn't a big problem uh, with it. Um, so uh, the biggest, I think the biggest change that you see nowadays is that the nails, the nails you now do have no slot and are much, much um, thicker in their wall. And that's because um, there was a whole issue with these nails with torquing. So you could end up putting this nail in and it, if you put a tight nail in, uh, it would twist and you could end up having your distal holes pointing 90 degrees opposite to the uh, place they were supposed to be whole. And that was related to the, the, the basically the slot in the nail and the th thinness of the wall and um, the amount of reaming. You never knew that before this, okay? But uh, until we were had to go and start locking them and then we suddenly realized how much a nail torques going down the canal. That's uh that sounds like a big problem. Uh, it, but if you learned how to freehand interlocks like you did, probably uh overcomable versus that fancy picture of the jig they had attached to the C arm. That jig was amazing. I'll tell you, I'll tell you it worked like a charm. The we only can't problem, figure out distal yeah. targeting these days, but they had it figured out in the seventies. Yeah, the only the only problem with it was it had to be sterile, and that. And then you had to find it. And so, you know, at two o'clock in the morning when you needed to find it, the nurse had no idea what you were talking about. So, so nothing's changed, huh? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned that, uh, like, we're talking about the static nerve article just being worried about being sued and stuff like that. So, you know, what was going through, like, Ted's head when they were nailing these? I mean, I know he felt that he was doing the right thing for the patient, which obviously he was, but how did that... Were you, were you there during that time point when they were doing this? Because I had heard that he would do them in the middle of the night when nobody was around, and that would kind of sneak around and do them at first. But Right. Um, it was not, it, it really wasn't, I don't, you know, a big problem at that because they were dealing with, um, Harborview was its own sort of 
um, Mecca yeah. place and yeah. universe. Um, he was doing this. Yes, there was a lot of flack coming at him, but um, he had the support within the institution to do it. Okay. So, you know, I think the, the big answer to it was, is he could never have done that if he didn't have the support of the general trauma surgeons there, which he did. And I think they, th those guys, th those guys at that time were all leaders in the multiple trauma and the resuscitation world. And so I think there was, there was a culture in Harborview that this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. You know, I can tell you as a, you know, as a fellow out there, you know, from anesthesia point of view, they didn't care what, what was wrong with the patient. They just put them to sleep. You know, um, I can remember getting called by the anesthesia and one of the anesthetists saying, get over here. I said, what, what are you worried about? He, he says, no, this patient's ready to go. I've got them to sleep. And I'm going, you have <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, yeah, they would look after them. So I, I think at the really what was happening was it was a combined group that were trying to improve the care of um, the multiple trauma patient. One of our problems is we don't see that from an orthopedic view. We see the orthopedic side. We see Hanson doing this. The general surgeons see themselves over here doing their thing in the ICU and all of this and where they're going. And yet at the end of the day, we've managed to push the care of the patient forward and um, in, in that environment. So I, I think that's probably what was happening with him. Great. Thanks for that. Um, one follow-up question to maybe bring it all together. So with your explosion fracture paper, um, and while you didn't publish this paper, you were involved in the early introduction of newer techniques. What advice would you give younger surgeons, residents, people listening to, um, to that effect when it comes to, to pushing the needle, to doing what's right, to ultimately advocating for patient care despite sometimes the overwhelming momentum or push of the system trying to put impediments in the way? Like, how did you overcome that? Or what advice would you give? Um, I think it, it's for, first, first and foremost, um, I think it's understanding what you're getting into, okay? Um, and, and seeing where, where you're going and what you're doing. Um, so with lock nailing, I saw the results of what he was, what Gross was achieving. And when you saw that, you said, this, this is right. Okay. I don't care. You know, there was a lot of pushback. I can tell you in Toronto, when I brought it back, um, everybody thought I was total nuts and I was going to have kids with five heads because of the radiation and on and on and on and on and on. But as I did it and people began to see the results, then it all changed. And I think that's the thing is you have to, you have to see something, realize uh, that is something that I can do and the results appear to be worthwhile. There were a few other things that we got into like humoral nailing, okay? Uh, humoral nailing was a, you know, it was the exact opposite. It never really worked. Uh, we did a lot of humoral nails and there's a couple of papers that you can read with Barry Reamer and myself, some, some of the disastrous results from them, but it was never it, that's that thing. And that was carried a bit. We probably carried it a bit too far. So um, yeah, so you can nail a humerus, but it wasn't what this, this is for the tibia and the femur. So I think the answer is one, see what's going on. And if it's working well, it's something that you should jump on and, and get on with and, and promote. And then to get it through, it's a matter of data okay? and showing people that it works. So, you know, um, what I, you know, what I used to do with this was when I, I did my clinic in the same place that Tile did his. Tile was never a big, he thought this was the stupidest thing he had seen because we, you know, we do plates and that sort of thing. And so every time we had one of these patients come in, I had the fellow go over and put the pic, you know, that time we had films, put the films up on the view box where Tile was standing. So he had to look <laughs> at them. And then out of the blue, about a year later, he comes to me and he says, have you got any of those x-rays of people with that? Cause I've got to go and talk on this. And it's, 
And this is the technique that we should be using. So it was a matter of just showing people what you can achieve and where you go and believing, believing in it, you know, um, it's the same, you know, like fixing pelvic ring fractures and that sort of thing. The initial starts on all of that were, you know, I can tell you weren't, weren't the most pleasant in the world, but if you look at it and you see where we are today as, as to where we were in 1979, 1980, it's like night and day, um, from what we, what we can do. And it's just a matter of understanding that, thinking about it, working, trying to promote it and trying to push it. So yeah, I think you've got to, you got to be um, honest with yourself that what you're doing is worthwhile. Um, avoid the money side. Okay. Don't get tied into this because some guy, they want you and they're going to pay you to do all of this, et cetera. That will be a disaster. Uh, if you can, if they want to, and then you think it's good, that's nothing wrong with it. But I think a lot of stuff gets pushed um, basically uh, because someone's making something out of it um, from that point of view. So um, I think that's the answer to it. Thank you. Awesome. So no other questions. I just have a couple more slides to go through and then we'll just give some thank yous here. It's like there was one question. We already got that one answered. Uh, upcoming journal club events. We have a few going on. We have one similar to this coming up in October, uh, June and August. Both have journal clubs that they're we're still working on the definitive topics for that. So just keep an eye out for that. Some fellow webinars coming up May fourteenth, September twelfth. Uh, some good topics. Some other AO trauma webinars uh, May eighth and August fifteenth. Um, the AO, my AO app is a great app to use. Uh, it can help with the Q and A sessions. You can kind of continue the conversation after any of these journal clubs. I am on my AO. There's a case folio, so if you have any interesting cases that you want to upload, maybe get some ideas from others. You can do that on there. As well as like, thanks to everyone. Uh, for being involved, Dr. Kellum, thank you so much for providing us these articles, not only for this discussion, but obviously just contributing to all the stuff that's done in the literature and giving us a, a great history lesson tonight and all these wonderful articles that really impacted us. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to read them and to come up with good, good solid questions that made it. I, I enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah, great. Likewise. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. All right, thanks everyone.